Well, good morning. Um, I'm sure people are just um, linking on to this now as um, you've enjoyed the worship here. But good morning to and welcome to Storehouse Church Alford um, to the Sunday morning service to all my brothers and sisters in Christ in Alford. I say good morning and what a pleasure it is to be here with you this morning. If you're watching from elsewhere, good morning, Ben, Macy, I can see you there. Morning, Ben. Uh, good morning. Welcome to everyone who's uh, coming to Alford uh, this morning and just sharing in a time of reflecting on God and his word and enjoying the worship. Good morning, Justine. Lovely to see you uh, as well. It's just to me, it's a real privilege to be here uh, with you all this morning. Always lovely. I miss you and you're always in my heart and you're in my prayers uh, as well. So again, just a great privilege to be with you this morning. So um, I'm going to start get started. Um, so we're continuing in the series that Mandy's been leading you through um, and Philippians and what an amazing book it is. Uh, such a book of encouragement uh, and challenge as well. It's wonderful to see the Apostle Paul and the affection uh, that he had for the church but also the um, that he was pleased with their progress in the Lord, pleased with their support. Good morning, Ian, and with all um, that, that they were um, progressing in towards um, you know, following Christ uh, in the way that he is. And so, good morning, Naomi. And so we continue this morning with that. So, so last week, Mandy was looking at Philippians 3, uh, verses 1 to 9, and that's where Paul was encouraging the Philippians to watch out for the Judaizers and the ones who were saying, oh, no, you have to continue to follow the law. You have to do all these things and find the righteousness that the law uh, previously gave them. But he's saying, no, absolutely not. What you should be doing, morning, Mandy, morning. Uh, what you should be doing, rather than looking for the righteousness that is in the law, is looking and looking only for the righteousness that is in Christ and having no confidence in the flesh, but all confidence in Christ. And Paul kind of leaves off uh, in, in those final verses in 1 to 9, uh, saying how, you know, he's given up everything uh, to win Christ, to gain Christ. That's his sole goal and his sole um, uh, calling. So we're going to pick it up, and it's weird because morning, Celia, morning. It, we'll pick it up from verse 10 in chapter 3, and it, it kind of, you know, there's not a, a clean break, so it's kind of where do you break it off, but we'll pick up um, from chapter verse 10, rather, in chapter 3, if I can get my words out. Okay, so let's read Philippians 3, 10 to 21, and I'm using a New American Standard Bible this morning. So Paul says, that I may know him, meaning Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already grasped, grasped it, or have already become perfect, but I press on if I may also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you as well. However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even as I weep that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who have their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body, by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Amen. So that's our, our reading for today. And I have to say, I did, you know, send some notes and things to Mandy. I struggle uh, sometimes with Paul. I think his writing is excellent. But the, the interesting thing about Paul is he writes, it's 
what's not said, what's not written. So, you know, you look at verse 10, verses 10 to 11, where he says, I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, it seems to me plain on its face, but there is so much in there. Paul is essentially talking about everything that Christ has done for us, everything that we have earned in him, and what it means to grasp and hold on to that. And those two verses in themselves are uh, at least one sermon. But um, I was thinking, well, how do I sum it up? Because I don't think that that's quite where one, I'm being called to go this morning. But in terms of just looking at those verses, knowing Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection, uh, the reformer John Calvin put it this way, and I think it kind of sums it up. He says, Christ, therefore is rightly known when we feel how powerful his death and resurrection are and how efficacious or how of great benefit and use they are in us. Now all things are furnished to us, meaning through Christ, uh, expiation and destruction of sin, freedom from condemnation, satisfaction, victory over death and the attainment of righteousness and the hope of a blessed immortality. And again, even in those words alone, there are more sermons, but it says that we have freedom, we have redemption, we have hope, we have power, we have a future in Christ. And he's saying that his goal is to know all these things, to gain and really grab hold of all of these things. So that that's what Paul's overriding uh, concern is, and he expresses that, again, in those verses there. But that's just a small part of the reading. Uh, if we're looking from 12 onwards, Paul is talking predominantly about his passion and his pursuit. And so I think that there are about three or four terms, umbrella terms, that kind of sum up what he's saying to us uh, or saying to the Philippians and to us by extension in those verses. And number one, I think it's about obsession. I think it's about obsession. Paul has said, uh, again, going from verses 9 and bringing up to where we are, you know, he's concerned le leaving everything, giving up everything in order. Oh, good morning, Becca. Good morning, my sister. Praise, praise be with you. Peace be with you. Uh, and I pray you're recovering well this morning. Okay. Uh, I've gotten off track. But yes, uh, so Paul is saying that he's given up everything to know Christ. He's given up his all in order that he can gain Christ. And so he's expressing this great desire. He doesn't care about the confidence, as was pointed out before. He doesn't care about all of his achievements, his being a Hebrew of Hebrews, being a Pharisee, being righteous under the law, etc., etc. doesn't care about any of it. It's all just rubbish. Uh, we could use other words uh, to express just how much rubbish he thinks it is, but we'll use that word uh, to keep it clean. But he is, and in terms of losing those things though, he's really pursuing Christ. That's all he cares about. That is all he cares about, knowing Christ, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. If Christ suffered uh, the internal sufferings of uh, the flesh, you know, wanting to do what's right but doing what's wrong instead and vice versa, the, the external sufferings, trying to get the gospel out there, being beaten, stoned, thrown outside city gates, shipwrecked, etc., etc., put into prison, copied, uh, called a madman, dung, yes, dung, Mandy, that... <laughs> That was Paul's putting a, a shine on it, wasn't it? Morning, Sarah. You know, so that's what Paul is saying. That's his only concern now. His only desire is to know Christ. And so the word is obsession. Paul is absolutely obsessed and consumed with knowing Christ. He cares about nothing else. And I think that's one of the main words to us this morning. You know, are we as consumed with knowing Christ? Are we as consumed with understanding everything about his person, his characteristics, about his offices and all that God has used him for, all that he stands for, all that he embodies, all the titles that he has? Are we concerned with knowing the power of his resurrection and knowing that we don't have to live uh, to sin, that we can overcome the flesh? And are we concerned, are we as concerned with attaining to the resurrection. And Paul says here, and it's important to point out, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, he's not doubting 
his salvation. He's just being realistic and saying that although these are the things that I want to achieve and ultimately I want to be raised, you know, with the dead in Christ on that great day of the Lord, but he's recognizing that there are trials, tribulations, temptations, barriers, toils, all sorts of things stand in the way of that. It is a long, hard road. You know, and there's a bit of humility as well as realism in there. I've got a long way to go, but this is where I'm headed to. Knowing Christ, being found in him, and certainly being recalled by him. But then moving on at, to, to verse 12, and I think this is where the majority of what Paul starts to talk about. Not that I have already grasped it at all, have already become perfect, but I press on for the goal. He goes on to say, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet. Uh, and he presses on, verse 14, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Press on, uh, trying, leaving, reaching forward to what's ahead, leaving what's behind. This is Paul's obsession, okay? He wants to get there, and he has not only given up all for the cause of Christ, but now he is giving his all in gaining Christ, in winning Christ. He's reaching forward, he's pressing forward to a goal, trying to reach a mark, and Paul... Even Paul hasn't made it there yet, but he's doing the best that he can. He is putting every sinew and every bit of energy and every bit of power that he has into reaching that. But what about us? You know, Paul is striving to gain Christ, striving with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. But are we striving or are we just strolling? You know, are we really pressing forward to make sure that we are identifying with Christ in all that he suffered, or are we just strolling? Are we striving or strolling? You know, for myself, I've had to come into, you may notice I'm in a different room, you know, this is my new room, it's not really a new room, but where I, I'm trying to spend more time uh, in the word, more time in prayer, more time in worship, more time in uh, gaining Christ, because I want to be found in him, same as Paul. And so I've had to give up uh, lounging on my sofa, my nice big sofa in the living room, and watching TV and enjoying uh, the foods that I like to eat. I don't have time. Okay, I just don't have the time because I, like Paul, want to gain Christ. And I feel convicted, you know, or challenged, should I say, uh, this morning and through this study. Yeah, yeah, striving as opposed to, to strolling. But I want to strive harder. You know, I want to put more time into knowing Christ. I want to put more time into recognizing all that he has won for me. The power that I have over Satan, the power that I have over sin, and the power that I have over the world. I want to recognize that. I want to know that he's repaired my relationship with God. I want to know how much God loves me. I want to know how much God cares for me, rejoices in me, uh, and how much freedom I have in him that I need to feel, as I said earlier with Calvin's comments, that I need to feel no condemnation. You know, a lot of us walk around under the cloud of condemnation. If you're in Christ, that's not of him. That's not what he died for. You know, we're to walk around with our heads held high because we have a sonship in Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are children of the living God. And I want to understand that better. I want to walk around like that. I want to walk around with a crown on my head because I represent the high king of heaven and am found in him. That God doesn't look on me. When he looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the blood of Christ and he loves me. And he cares for me, and not just for me, but for all of us who are in Christ. And even if you're not in Christ yet, you can be. This is his desire and his call for you. But as we pursue this, it needs to be an obsession with us. And we need to be possessed. You know, Paul talks about um, in, in verse, um, verse 12 that he presses on to take hold of that for which even Christ had taken hold of him. So it's his desire to have this and he's pursuing it with a real determination. But we've got to recognize that it's by divine design that we are made into the image of Christ. It's by divine design that we seek to know Christ better, that we seek to uh, know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. You know, God has no issue with us knowing him as well as we possibly can. There's a verse that my mom is always fond of quoting, and it's from, I'll just read it to you. It's from Jeremiah 9, uh, verses 23 to 24. This is a King James Version, so bear with me. 
Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So God has no problem if we want to be obsessed with him, if we want to be possessed with knowing him. In fact, he wills it, he welcomes it, and that's why he has taken hold of us, that we might know these things about him, that we might be found in him. But So Paul is urging the Philippians, he's urging us that we really need to put our back into this and get with the program. It's not about us, it's about Christ, identifying with him on every possible level. But Paul's being realistic, again, and encouraging at the same time. If you notice his language, he says he doesn't count himself as having attained it yet. Uh, he's pressing on, uh, and he's looking to win it, he hasn't taken hold of it yet. But he's trying, he's striving, he's continuing on, you know, and he says for those who are mature, let's have this mind. Um, and if you don't have that attitude yet, God will help you. But in the meantime, live by that same standard uh, to which you have attained, verse 16. So Paul is essentially saying, look, okay, we have no chance of getting there yet, really, in this lifetime, but it's a pursuit that we have to carry on with. Yeah, we need to recognize that it happens by degrees. We attain by degrees, by using what we have already learned. Yeah, because what we have, if we're using that, then we will receive more. So Paul, even Paul, who has given up everything, who is giving everything, still hasn't gotten there. And yet he strives on. What an encouragement to us that we too, no matter how far behind Paul we may all be, whatever little bit of understanding we have of Christ, let's use that and build on that. You know, if you recognize that Christ loves you, start there. And then the more that you engage with him and recognize that he loves you, you'll start to realize that he's also forgiven you, that he's equipped you, uh, that he calls you to spend time with him. And, you know, and it builds on, it builds on, it builds on. And I'm going back to those early verses uh, in this reading, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So it's knowing all that he has done for us, all that he has won for us, the power of his resurrection, all that we can do in him so that we're then equipped to stand as we know the fellowship of his sufferings. So it's by degrees that we come to to gain Christ. And you know, God is always wise to not give us more than we can handle. Kind of like when he brought Israel into the promised land. Um, I forget which book it's in. And he talks about, I'm only giving you so much of the land, you know, at a time so that you're not overrun by the animals and, 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 and the beasts and things. So God works in measures uh, with us. And we've got to work and recognize that it's going to happen in measures. It's going to happen by degrees, but it doesn't stop us from pursuing it. The fact that we will not attain all of it in this life, we have to attain as much as we can and certainly use as much as we do have. And so Paul then, after encouraging them, you know, showing his obsession with Christ and how he's looking to possess Christ, but indeed Christ has possessed him for the purpose of being obsessed with him and gaining him and that he's progressing by degrees. But then he also invites the Philippians then, and this is the invitation to us too, to join the procession. Join the procession. God says, uh, God, Paul says, verse 17, brothers and sisters, Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. He's saying, get in line behind me. You see how I am sold out for Christ, obsessed and possessed by him. Get in line and follow me. This is the way to walk, to give up everything so that you may gain everything in Christ. And he's warning them also that when it comes to the procession, we've got to choose you know, which line are we going to walk in? Which line are we going to get in line with? Who are we going to line up behind? Is it those who are following Christ, pursuing Christ the way he is hotly? Or these, which he speaks about again, uh, those who walk as enemies of the cross? 
who are satisfying themselves. They have their minds on earthly things, who glory in their shame, whose God is their appetite, right? They engage in every sort of lust, desire, whatever they want to do, and whose end is destruction, whose end is destruction. Basically, is Paul kind of saying, you know, you can't follow two gods, you can't serve God and mammon, which way are you going to go? You know, you're either going to follow me and it's all about Christ, or you're going to follow these who have their foot on the other path and whose end is destruction, who have no interest in the things of God. You know, and you go back to chapter two, where Paul was talking about sending Timothy and Epaphroditus because they were the only ones that he could be sure of who were minding the things of Christ like he was and not minding, you know, their own glory or their own bellies and stuff. We have to be careful, you know, who we follow. Um, you've got pastors, Mandy and Martin, you know, who when they first came on, if you'll recall, they said, follow us as we follow Christ. And this is not Paul saying the same thing. So it sounds like they're on the right on the right track, you know, and on the right page. And so, you know, I, that's the other way I was going to take this message was looking at example uh, and the power of example. But, you know, perhaps that's another time. But yes, you know, we're called to follow the right examples because Paul says, follow me and those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So, you know, he's not trying to just say, oh, it's all about me. But anyone that you see following Christ properly, we can follow those examples. You know, but the flip side of that is, is our life worthy of being an example for someone else to follow. You know, if we are pursuing Christ as hard and as hotly as Paul is, then we should have no shame and no reservations with telling other people, hey, follow us, telling a new Christian, you know what, do what I do because I'm sold out for Christ and I want you to be. Get in line so that we are all part of that train. Remember, Christ is the first of many brethren as he ascends into heaven, resurrected from the dead. That's the line that we're supposed to be following in. That's the line that we're supposed to be walking in. Uh, and yes, being good role models and good influencers. So other people get in line behind us. So we're to get in line, but increase the line uh, as well. Um, Let's see, where am I? So yes, I think that that is everything for this particular um, line of of analysis, shall I say. The Paul is just uh, expressing here the intensity and the singularity of his pursuit uh, of Christ. And I don't know, perhaps it's, it, this is what came to me uh, this morning. And I just wonder if it's not, again, in light of the fact that the times are going to change. Um, times are going to change. We're needing to keep our eyes on Christ more than ever before. Um, in terms of the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, um, and, you know, again, we know, uh, as Paul was saying here, that ultimately our citizenship is in heaven and that Christ will come and receive us to himself and transform us to have heavenly bodies like unto his. But in the meantime, you know, we do have trials and tribulations that we have to undergo here. Um, I was just reading uh, the other night about um, a gentleman, I forget his name, I think it's Richard Page, um, who was an NHS uh, non-executive director, and he was a magistrate. And he was overseeing, um, overseeing a case, oh, I'm trying to read Manny's comments as well, thanks. He was overseeing a, a, an adoption case and mentioned that he felt that, you know, it was always better for a child to be raised in a family with a mother and father if they, if they could be, you know, pointing out that this was his Christian view. And for his, you know, for his being honest or whatever, he lost his job as a magistrate and he was struck off from being a director uh, for the NHS. So, you know, we've reached a time where just to share our Christian views, just to share biblical views uh, can cost you your job. So we're losing our freedom of speech. Is that not one of the trials and tribulations that we're going to have to face as we join with Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings? That is a big point. Uh, that is a big point because we're called as Christians to be witnesses, right? To be salt and light and to speak out. So, you know, it, it is important for us that we hold to Christ uh, more firmly, that we know who we are in him, know that he fights for us, intercedes for us at the right hands of God, at the right hand of God. And know, too, that, you know, 
he said that we'll be, you know, we will suffer uh, just as he suffered. The world hated him and it will hate us as well. We are not greater than our master. And that's the truth that we need to, to hold on to. Yes, as Mandy says there, we've got to be bold and yet support one another in it. Because, you know, when the rubber hits the road, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. And for those of us who work, you know, in public sector jobs and even in private sector jobs, um, as we speak out, as we have conversations, even, you know, with our uh, co-workers and stuff, we don't know, you know, who's going to suddenly rise up and decide that, oh, you know, they've been offensive because I've had to hear those views. And next thing you know, you're out on your ear. But God's got it all. God's got it all, and we do know that, you know, it's our lot, it's our privilege to be able to suffer for Christ. Um, but we've got to value that privilege more. We've got to, if we're speaking out more, um, if we are pursuing Christ more, we have to expect um, to, to pay for that. And the times, they're getting worse, they're getting darker, not lighter. So we've got to step up, shine more brightly. But as you know, if we step up, then Satan acts up. But in the end of the day, God has won it all for us in Christ. So we, we carry on. So in conclusion, I would just, you know, challenge you to say, how much do you value the prize? You know, Paul talks about the upward call of God in Christ as being a prize for which he is completely sold out. It is the only thing that he wants. Do we see it as a prize? You know, do we see it as a, a race to run, a contest, something that we're striving for? Uh, something that the word of God is the truth, but we are called to love, not judge. Uh, yes, but also not compromise. Amen, Martin. That's right. So a tricky balance. Um, you know, we've got to stick to the truth that we're in, uh, the truth that we know and that we represent. So do we value that prize, though? Do we value it as a prize? Are we trying to strenuously run that race, or are we just sort of strolling along? And how singularly are we pursuing this upward call of God in Christ? How singularly? You know, nothing else matters. I know many things seem important to us uh, in this world, but they're not. They're not. How refreshing it, it was for me to to hear Paul uh, in these words saying, I don't care. I don't care about anything else. If it's not Christ, I don't want to know. Don't bother me. Don't waste my time. If it's not about Christ, I'm not interested. You know, that that's what I'm sold out for. Um, and I think also of, of Jesus when he says, I have, you know, other, when he was talking to the woman at the, uh, the well in Samaria, and they're like, oh, have you eaten uh, the disciples? He's like, look, I've got other food that you don't know about. You know, I'm here to do my father's business. That that's the kind of attitude that we're supposed to have, that kind of singular focus uh, to be uh, pursuing Christ and pursuing the work uh, that he's left for us to do. So for us, it's to get with the program, okay, uh, to be in that hot pursuit. If you're not in hot pursuit, come on, hot it up. And to, to look and to reach forward for the prize. Stop strolling. Start striving. And I say it as much to myself as I do to, to you guys. You know, it's for all of us. It's for the church. The times are hotting up. You know, um, Mandy and Martin will tell you, things are, you know, the heat's being turned up in the kitchen. Uh, we've got to be able to, I don't know, sweat it out. <laughs> Step up and, and sweat it out. So, uh, ooh. Oh, Naomi said, today's word on my desk is, remember where to run. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Amen, Naomi. So yes, as we step up that pursuit, as we step up um, our defense of the truth, if we get any flack, God is who we turn to. God is who we run to. You know, if it was good enough for the angel to say to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, I'm not dealing with you, then we need to be saying the same. So let, let's close in prayer. I hope you were able to get something uh, from that. If you want to look into this more tonight, um, you can join us at Sunday Night Live. Sorry to make a plug for that. But um, I think I'm going to look more in the suffering, the fellowship of sufferings. But anyway, let's let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, the, the, the blessing that is your word, Lord, and for all those who have gone before us uh, to write it down. We thank you for Paul's letter to the Philippians, which is a great encouragement, Lord. And, and Father God, I think it is such a timely thing uh, that you've led Mandy to study this uh, with the church at Alford at this time. And I just pray that you'll continue to bless them, uh, to guide them, Lord, to help them to 
keep their eyes not only fixed on you, Lord, but to keep um, th themselves um, steeped in you, in your word, uh, in knowing Christ, and knowing everything about him. But Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name um, that you'll just help us to rejoice in knowing you, to to solely care about knowing you, about serving you, and to be able to make our boast, Lord, in knowing you. May our pride and joy not be in ourselves and our achievements, but in you and you alone, all that you have done and all that you have yet to do. For we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd love to go on for another two hours, but I realize there are other things to do. So God bless you. Wonderful to be with you. Um, there is a Zoom chat uh, after this. So the details are on the Facebook page. So uh, if I can log on, I look forward to seeing you there. But otherwise, I will see you on Saturday for another installment of Breakfast Bible. And uh, look forward to seeing you then. But God bless you all. Love you all. Amen.